Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the result of my experiment in suggesting that we start to do some talks about the world's most beautiful melody, my choice and yours. I asked for your suggestions and Boy, did I get suggestions. You can look at the comments of the previous chat and you'll see. I have to say, first of all, I want to thank everybody who contributed and is continuing to contribute. And you should still continue to contribute, whether on, on that original chat or this one or any of the ones to come. I really, really value your participation. I'm honored, really, that you would take the time to do it. I think it's so wonderful because not only not only does it give us a chance to share each other's interests, and I really, really recommend that you read the comments. You should all look at what your colleagues and friends have, have chosen because it's a wonderful, eclectic mix of stuff, and we're going to go into that in a minute. But I, I'm so touched and so honored that you would you would share your own feelings and thoughts in this particular way with me. I mean, it's just, it's a gift. It's an absolute gift to me. And so I want to thank you all from the bottom of my heart. We're going to have a really, really good time with this. Now, the unfortunate thing is that I can't respond to all of you, much as I would love to, because there are just too many suggestions. And I can't pick, you know, a, a selection to do constantly because then I would be doing nothing else. And of course, we have tons and tons of music to talk to. So please do not take it amiss if I don't pick your your choice or mention your choice. Your choice is as wonderful as anyone else's choice. But, you know, we have to draw the line somewhere. I can only be very, very selective. And I'm going to pick stuff. I don't know what the system is going to be, whether it tickles my fancy, whether I do the Brown University method. Do you remember the Brown University method when the admissions at Ivy League colleges took off and it turned out that the admissions person was a little old lady in a little room or something like that at Brown University in Rhode Island and and she would take all the applications and throw them down the stairs and the people that made it to the bottom step got in. I, mean, I could do it that way if I could find a cyber way to do it. I don't know. I don't know. So there's going to be a real element of randomness to this whole process. So I beg your indulgence as we go through this. Now, I have to get now to our first selection and our first comment. Well, first, before I do that, though, let me just talk to you about, I have a list here of some of the wonderful variety of things that you chose. You'll see them in the comments, but I was just so impressed. I mean, it's wonderful. And also talk to you a little bit more about some of the parameters, which I think we need to clarify. First of all, if you are a non-English speaker, don't worry about your grammar or style. Just write. Do what you can do. I'll clean it up when I talk about it. Don't worry. If you want me to try and do it in an ethnic accent, feel free to ask. I'm not sure what's going to happen or how offended everyone will get, but I can always try. Anyway, I mean, the, the, the selections were wonderful. There was, of course, a lot of Mahler, some Rachmaninoff, some Mozart, Mozart and Brahms clarinet quintets, both of them, which was kind of interesting. Messiaen's Tarangalela Symphony, that was kind of fun. And and let's see, oh, the Tuban Sinfonietta, that's a lovely work. I think we may do that, who knows? But uh, that was a wonderful suggestion, so thank you. And and a bunch of, of operatic things. I mean, the intermezzo from Cavalleria Rusticana, I can understand that one. That is one hell of a tune, isn't it? And and Verdi Prati from Handel's Alcina, and also from from Giulio Cesare and other Handel operas. Now, we have an opera issue. The opera issue is this, and it's actually a general issue. I can only play things that I have recordings where I have permission to use them. So so that's part of my consideration. It doesn't have to be yours, but you should be aware of it because I really, I really, really wish I could play everything or anything and just grab a record and play a thing that you chose, but I can't because of the copyright situation. I keep trying and we're doing pretty well in getting permissions, but, but it's, it's, it's a project and so you should be aware of that. And the other selection we got, I mean, we got some Gregorian chant, which could be fun. And we also got green sleeves. And that reminded me of a version of green sleeves. Do any of you know the, the green stamp version of green sleeves? Do you remember green stamps? 
SNH green stamps. That was when you went to the supermarket, at least when I was a kid, you, you got a certain number of them depending on how much you spent and you pasted them into your green stamp book. And when you had a certain number of books all filled out with green stamps, you could trade them in and get stuff, you know, like a toaster. And if you had like 300 million books, you could get like a car. There was always some some news feature about some lady in the Midwest who'd save 400,000 green stamp books and she traded it in for like a Rolls Royce or something. It was amazing. But, you know, my mother used to collect green stamps and there was a song that was evolved around that practice. <clears throat> and I'm going to sing it for you so you can turn off your, your volume now. Are you ready? It went like this. I found my love in a grocery shop Selling pickles and eggplants and bottles of pop She asked me to try her asparagus tips And I fell for the smile <clears throat> On her ruby red lips Green stamps were all she gave Green stamps were all I took Green stamps were all I saved, and I pasted them all in my green stamp book. There. So there's the, the green sleeves selection, and I, I hope you'll forgive me for it, but that just brought back such a happy memory that I wanted to share with you all. But now, the pièce de résistance. The piece of music comes from Miroslav Georgiev, who suggested the big tune in the finale of Sibelius's first symphony. Here is what Miroslav writes. And I think this was a lovely comment. He wrote, after hearing the Dvorak that I submitted, wow, that is a wonderfully beautiful tune. However, I submit an even more beautiful melody. Yeah, nice try, Muro. One that always, without fail, reduces me to tears every time I hear it, no matter how many times I hear it. It, ha it has yet to not do it for me. And that's the central section of the finale to Sibelius's first symphony. I'm assuming that means the big tune because the central section is kind of a fugato thing, but that's another issue. Whenever I hear it, my body physically seizes with anticipation for that big tune. Yeah, with its impossibly luscious string sonority, its soaring quality, and all the mental associations I have built up over the months I've been listening to it. I always imagine an incredibly hard-won victory against the forces of darkness. And what a dark key E minor is, it really is or a symphonic hero declaring his undying love to his companion. There's something so utterly final about this finale that you just don't find in even the obvious great works with great finales, like Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. If Sibelius ever had a finale problem, he did. He sure as hell didn't in, in his first proper symphonic attempt. So thank you, Miroslav. I think that's a beautiful statement and I am delighted to be able to play the music for you now. But I want to point out a couple things about this melody that also that strike me just to second your, your own choice. First, let me close out this, this glary thing here. There we go. There we go. First of all, this tune is the most Tchaikovskyan thing that Sibelius ever wrote. It really is. It's as close as he got to Tchaikovsky, but there are significant differences. And I want you to listen for them. One is the harp part, which instead of just doing like arpeggios as it's going, does all kinds of stuff. It's going thwang, quang, a quang, a wang, a wang. It's, 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 like, it's like going nuts in the background. And actually, if you listen also, for example, to the timpani and the lower strings, on top of this incredibly luscious melody, as Miro describes it quite aptly, there is a lot going on. There's a tension, a real tension to this melody, that from the timpani rolling and the harp twanging and the lower strings chugging, and it really, it really creates a, a, an incredible force and passion in what Sibelius is trying to express. And the other thing that I find absolutely fascinating and it's something else that he did actually at the end of Finlandia too is when he gets to the climax of the melody 
you know, Tchaikovsky would have given the whole thing to the string sections, you know, rising in sequences, becoming ever more passionate and tense. Sibelius doesn't do that. Sibelius allows the strings to take the tune up to the climax, and then they they stop with a syncopated rhythm, just going chunk, 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 like this, and he gives the tune to the trumpets. And my God, what a difference that makes. It gives the entire melody, the entire climax, a sort of icy, I have to I'll say it, it's an icy, dark gleam to it. It makes it sound far more fateful, I think, much more dramatic. And so when the tune ultimately collapses, as it does right afterwards, you have an entirely different character. In a way, that melody remains somewhat unfulfilled, doesn't it? And one of the reasons you know that that's going to happen is because of the way the trumpets take over the tune at the climax. It changes the whole complexion of the passage. And it's such a beautiful, beautiful touch. So thank you, Miro, for that selection. Now, let's listen to it. With all of that in mind, I have a wonderful performance, which I can play for you. Life Segerstam and the Helsinki Philharmonic on Undine. So here it is. That was one man's choice for the most beautiful melody in the world. Miroslav Georgiev and the big tune from the finale of Sibelius' First. Thank you, Miroslav. I really appreciate your suggestion and for your eloquent words in support of your choice. I will be doing many, many more of these over time, I promise. But again, like I said, we have so much to talk about. It has to be an occasional thing, but I'll try and arrange as many occasions as I possibly can. And in the meantime, do please keep sending me your suggestions because it's so touching and heartwarming to hear everything coming from you. Especially, you know, the, the weirder selections, I have to say, you know, like Elliot Carter's Piano Concerto, that was great. And don't laugh, people, because there are gorgeous things in a lot of Elliot Carter. So, uh, you know, we have, we have an infinite selection, and we're going to have a good time with this for many, many years to come, I hope. So thank you for joining me. Keep on listening to those gorgeous melodies. Take care.